you so much. Uh, my name is Perla Santillan. I guess I didn't even put my name in there. Look at me. Um, but Kate did it. Um, I work for the Office of Chief Medical Examiner. I'm what they call their Mass Fatality Response and Planning Manager, which is a mouthful. Um, in short, I'm the emergency planner, emergency manager for the office. And if you wonder, what do they need one of you? That's a great, great question. I don't know, uh, but I am very glad. Um, but they do, um, well, the reason is because um, in the state of Virginia, the OCME is responsible for managing mass fatality incidents. Um, therefore, they need somebody to, that can be able to talk to partners, uh, do planning, um, and, then, and so our office can focus on what they do in their daily activities. So that's why I'm here. A um, little bit about my background, I'm also a forensic, uh, forensic anthropologist. Um, I went to VCU to get my forensic um, science master's, and previous to that, I spent 10 years almost in nonprofit emergency management. So I do feel that I have the best of the both worlds, and I'm able to understand both worlds. Uh, but today, I'm going to talk about OCME in general, but we will talk a little bit about mass fatality and why is it that we perhaps may need volunteers um, to help us out in, with our mission and with uh, fatality management. So. Um, what are our objectives today or our agenda? Well, there, there's stuff that we're going to talk about, but let's see, let's see where this goes. And our objectives is just to learn something that perhaps we didn't know before. I do have access to the chat. So if you have any questions at any given point, please let me know and I'll do my best to answer them. And actually we're going to start doing a, a little bit of use of our chat um can anybody share with with us uh who's your favorite fictional medical examiner or coroner not afraid to awkward silences so i'll wait for some of your responses abby quincy dr g of course <laughs> anybody else donkey of course okay oh, scarpetta oh wow jack lama bones oh, oh. two donkeys kind of a lecture that's a good one <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ducky is great. And I guess he has, um, there's a new one, right? Palmer for that same show. Oh, wow. Ducky is very popular. Well, yeah, that's great. Um, Bones. Bones, is, she is not a medical examiner, which is interesting. She's a forensic anthropologist. Uh, don't ask me what I think about that show. Um, but there is, they did have a medical examiner. I think her name was, um, uh, I know all of this because I literally asked this question. Um, uh, I'm like, no, no, Camille, Camille. Thank you, Lauren. Yes, Camille. Um, Derek, Derek, was that from? Oh, no, I'm thinking of Dexter. I'm not sure who Derek is. Um, from Grace and Emily, there was some medical examiner there. Oh, it's doctor. Okay, yes. Um, well, thank you very much for your answers. Some of them is Scorpetta. So um, just interesting thought, Scorpetta um, is a fictional, Melinda Warner, yes, that's one of my favorite from SV, SVU. Uh, Kate Scorpetta is a fictional medical examiner that actually started in Richmond. Um, and it's actually known that she's based on one of our previous chiefs. Um, the, her, the author actually spent some th time in our office when she was she lived in Richmond and she got inspired. And um, Dr. Fierro, exactly, thank you, Roberta uh, Sonem, Dr. Um, Marcella Fierro, who was our chief, our first female chief uh, for the Office of Chief Medical Examiner in Virginia, uh, is believed that she's inspired with her. I actually have the pleasure of meeting her and she is phenomenal. Um, all right, so thank you for sharing that. Hopefully that gives you an idea. And notice how I said uh, uh, ME or coroner. Um, if you know the difference between them, uh, please feel free to share. Um, so there is two systems, the coroner system versus the medical examiner system. So coroners are elected official appointed systems. Um, oh, somebody worked with Dr. Ferro. Oh, yeah, her, she, she is, um, well, we'll have to talk about that, Dr. Sonino, that, that Sonimo, Sonino, sorry. Um, 
So coroners are elected officials are not uniformly required to be physicians. Uh, medical examiners, however, are physicians who have specialized training in forensic pathology, um, and they can interpret death, death circumstances based on the injury, tex, uh, toxicology, medical conditions, um, and what they do is to determine cause and manner of death. The average education for medical examiners or forensic pathologists is 11 to 18 years. Um, uh, there are, like I mentioned, corner versus medical examiner system, and across the United States, it varies which one is um, which one is established in its state, and it is state based. Uh, most of the states uh, um, determine what they they will use depending on their population, uh, but it, it could also vary. Of course, the one that I'm most um, I'm familiar is Virginia. Uh, which is a centralized statewide. So we have one single chief, um, and then he oversees several medical examiners. Another one that I'm kind of familiar with is Texas. I am from Texas. Um, they actually, it's a very interesting, but I guess you can see it is a county based um, uh, mixture of medical examiners and coroner offices. So, as an example, I believe there's five actual medical examiners offices. One is in Harris County, one is in Fort Worth, um, in the county, not in the city. I'm sorry. The ones in Travis County and the other one in, in El Paso. I'm not sure which one is actually the, the, the county. Um, those counties serve some of the surrounding counties, but then the other one is just justice of the peace. Um, there's also one in Bear County in San Antonio. For example, in the, in, in the incident of the school shooting in Ovalde County, um, the person tasked to determine cause and manner of death was the justice of the peace in Ovalde. However, he did not felt that he was the appropriate person, so he asked help for the Bear County Medical Examiner System. Um, then there's other ones uh, like Florida. Um, I think I'm a little familiar that it's a county-based uh, medical examiner, meaning that each county has a medical exam examiner. Um, some counties may share them, just if they're small enough. Um, but then we have those uh, in the light greenish. Um, they're just county or district-based coroner offices. For example, Louisiana, um, they have one justice uh, coroner or justice of the peace appointed person, not necessarily to be a doctor, um, in each county. So when Katrina happened, this was a long time ago, but I do feel that it may still be an issue. Um, the system may actually collapse a little bit just because there's not really someone to be able to determine cause and manner of death. Um, so hopefully that helped a little bit to explain the different kinds of system. But like I said, ours, the one that I care the most, is the statewide system. Um, in 1946, uh, was formed by the General Assembly, and we are everything we do. It's in our code, um, and we are part of the investigation of death in Section 32. Point one and all of those it, it relates to us. Uh, before then, we actually went where a county based coroner medical examiner system. Uh, but thankfully, I believe that we, I do believe that it may be one of the best kinds of system to be statewide, just because a whole state can get together and actually agree on what's the best way to determine cause and manner of death. So our current chief um, is Dr. William Gormley, and he's been in that position since 2014. Another interesting thing is that we actually, um, our chiefs are not appointed, they're hired. And we do this with a purpose uh, because we wanna make sure um, that uh, they're not appointed by someone, therefore can give the perception of um, having favoritism to someone. Um, we do fall under the Virginia Department of Health, and we are accredited by the National Association of Medical Examiners. This association basically tells us the guidelines of how we should do our, the standards of how we should perform autopsy and investigation of deaths. Um, we do have four offices, and I'll talk a little bit about them. Um, we call them district offices just to make things more manageable. Um, but again, we only have one chief. In each of the, uh, the district offices, it has this operate the same way. 
So, like I said, we do have jurisdictions or districts, and those are the counties that um, the Northern District um, covers. They do have 17 counties, nine, oh, sorry, nine independent cities, and about 3.25 million people. Then uh, Central District, there it covers 39 counties, seven independent cities, and about 2.1 million people. Um, I forgot to mention that our um, check, um, the actual office in, Ma in Northern is in Manassas. The actual office is Central District. It's in Richmond and 4th Street and Jackson. Um, then Tidewater covers those counties and cities uh, or localities. Eight counties, 10 independent cities, 1.7 million people, and their offices are in North uh, Norfolk. Then we have Western. Uh, covers those counties and cities, uh, about 34 counties, 12 independent cities, 1.3 million people, and the office is in Roanoke. So, like I mentioned, each of them is staffed very similar. Um, there is about uh, four, there should be about four assistant chief medical examiners in each district. Um, these are the doctors for all forensic pathologists that actually determine cause of matter death and do those examinations. Uh, we also have medical legal death investigators who are the ones who take the calls and actually determine whether it should fall under jurisdiction. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, autopsy technicians, they assist our doctors in doing those examinations. Administrative personnel who answers the phone, do paperwork, uh, submit uh, everything that needs to happen. Security officers, since we are a 24 hour operation office, um, they receive uh, uh, decedents and they also release them to the funeral homes. Again, we do work 24 hours. And then there's some state support um, that work directly with the chief to just make things more uniform, such a forensic epidemiologist, um, for, um, the chief medical death investigator, myself. And we also have what's called the Virginia State Anatomical Program, who is the program that um, supervises or helps with full body donations for entities to actually practice um, surgeries or mortuary techniques. Um, so we do take some decisions, we prep them, and then we give them to these programs. Again, this is voluntarily that, that people have to be registered ahead of time. It's not like we go, they become um, a case and then we think they can be transferred to that program. No. Um, we also have a division of death prevention um, who they just try to gather all the information from uh, the investigations to try to provide recommendations on how potentially we can avoid those. We also have local medical examiners. Local med medical examiners are um, doctors, uh, physicians, assistants, um, nurse practitioners, um, or doctors osteopathic um, that can be appointed by our chief to do some examinations that we call them views. And we do this so they can be close to the localities and they don't take all the cases, but those who don't need a lot of supervision for my doctors, cases are more straightforward. And um, so they can be examined in the county and be released to their family and loved ones. So if you know any, MDs, DOs, PAs, and uh, nurse practitioners that would like to be local medical examiners, you can go to our website uh, under local medical examiners and get more information about that. We also have per diem investigators, kind of same purpose, just so they can be closer to the counties and localities and they can do those investigations. Oh, I'm already out of breath. Um, Again, if you have any questions, please share them in the chat. I'll be, uh, I can read them and, and answer them as we go. Everything we do is in our code and in the code of um, investigation of death, it states that open death of any person from trauma, injury, violence, poisoning, accident, suicide, certainly um, uh, death and certainly when in apparent good health or not attended by a physician or in jail, prison, um, basically everything that is in there, you can read it. Um, anything suspicion that is not natural 
uh, it would fall under our jurisdiction and we have to be notified by the physician in attendance, hospital, law enforcement, parent director, um, or anyone who may have knowledge of that debt. Um, and then we make that determination whether it does fall under our jurisdiction or not. Okay. So a couple of types of debt that we do investigate, so asphyxial debt, choking, drowning, debts to criminal violence, including terrorism-related debts, shootings, stabbings, accidents. Um, we do investigate every single motor vehicle of fatalities, uh, suicides, drug overdoses, and anyone who's in custody or inmate, um, falls, uh, environmental, so they died of hypothermia, hypothermia, drowning, or weather related as well, work related deaths, SIDS, suits, which is sudden um, unexpected death of infants and, or any unattended death. An unattended death meaning that they have not been seen by a physician for an extended period of time. All right, any questions so far about OCME's role? No, that was a lot of information that I threw at y'all. All right, I don't see none. So then um, I would like to talk to you about the role of the OCME and mass fatality. As you saw, um, anything that is not natural will come under jurisdiction, a mass fatality will be no uh, different. And so we, well, I can't really see. Um, we would investigate those deaths that are due to a mass fatality. And if you ask, what is it that the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner has established or defined as a mass fatality incident? Uh, well, it's a great and loaded question, but pretty much the chief has stated that it's a single event that overwhelms its local cap capabilities and whose. Um, it could be anyone that is involved. It could be our office or it could be the locality's ability to respond to it. Um, some very clear examples would be 9-11, um, you know, where uh, thousands of deaths, or uh, the shooting at uh, the Uvalde Elementary School, the building collapsed in Miami-Dade, um, deaths in a concert from shooting from far away from um, in, a, in a hotel, in La like in Las Vegas. Um, anything that would be natural deaths that creates a lot of fatalities, such as tornadoes that just um, make it a mobile home uh, complex or, you know, um, and it kills several individuals, floods, earthquakes, hurricanes, um, any kind of explosive, even uh, chemical agents or biological agents would also fall under our jurisdiction. So, what is, uh, oh, it's not moving. Sorry, there you go. Uh, so, what's our role in a, or mission in a mass fatality incident? So, we will still have to effectively manage all those fatalities uh, resulting from chemical, biological, basically everything that I just mentioned. Um, and we will have to do scene response, more operations, anti mortem data collection, and assist in scientific identification. I'll go through those in a bit. Uh, there is a question, is OCME investigating the suicide of the London County Dole Detention Center? So, um, I cannot answer that specific question. However, um, as I mentioned, we do have to investigate any deaths in custody. So, if there is a death that has been in a custody prison uh, or in the state custody, we do have to investigate. So, I'm sorry, I, do not, I cannot provide that specific information. Um, so, we will also have to not just respond to this mass fatality incident, but also um, continue to do non-event demands of the community, continue to do those other um, this um, autopsy examination. Um, there's a question, can a family member request an autopsy on someone who doesn't fall into any of those categories? Uh, the short answer, no, is because we cannot deviate from our code. Um, again, the only way we could potentially do that is if law enforcement believes that it is it's not a natural death. Um, 
There are private autopsies that can be happened in the hospitals that a family member can uh, re um, ask, but of course they will be um, most likely to charge um, everything or and everything we do, we do not uh, charge um, the community or the family member. So um, unless uh, the law enforcement believes that it is not a natural death and there may be something suspicious so that they need to investigate. We can always change the, um, from not taking the case to taking it. So why, oh, that is a great question, uh, events. Uh, why would we deter, um, take salmon deaths occurring from natural disaster? Because it's not uh, a natural, a natural will be a heart attack. Um, also, when there is um, natural disasters, cause of death can be masked. Um, for example, in Katrina, Louisiana, they found uh, several decedents that they believe they were due to flooding or drowning uh, due to the water, but they actually found stabbing. So things could be masked. Um, and we also have to figure out how they the mechanism in which they died. Was it blood force trauma? Um, so hopefully that that will help with that. Um, again, everything we do has to be acceptable in a court, um, in civil or criminal court. Uh, so it is important that we do all of those things uh, properly. All right. Um, so, why do we have to do scene response in a mass fatality incident? Um, and it, this will also help with your question events. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's a building collapse, a shooting, or a natural disaster. Um, we have to make sure we manage and document the scene, including remains, evidence, personal effects, because all of these can actually help us with identification. Um, if a person dies in a natural um, uh, disaster doesn't have any ideas or anything, um, then we need to figure out who they are, and that goes part with our investigation. Um, we have to recover and manage um, the decedents on the scene and make sure that we preserve all the context um, so we can, like I mentioned, we can potentially identify them. Um, and recovery of evidence um, associated with the remains. And we will do this by sending a team uh, to the incident that can help do all of these things. An example of this, and this is a very, I don't necessarily quite qualify as a mass fatality, but it did overwhelm um, the law enforcement because they didn't know how to proceed. And like, this is something that I mentioned, it's not necessarily the number of fatalities, but also the circumstances and how overwhelmed uh, locality can be. Um, so, um, there was a plane traveling from Louisville to uh, Shell, whatever, and um, it was going from the Stafford Airport. It attempted to land, but it hit several trees um, on both sides of the runway, it crashed in a wooded area. And this happened about 1231 hours on August uh, 12 in 2016. Uh, we sent investigators um, to the scene uh, around 7 p.m. And we were notified for two hours. It does take us time to gather our stuff uh, and to actually get to the scene. And in this case, it was very important for us to be there because depending, uh, it helped a lot to identify the individuals because where they were found, it was similar to where they departed. So it can help us figure out who the pilot is, who the co-pilot is, and who um, are the passengers. So they were able to photograph everything uh, tag everything properly, and then they could be removed uh, to our incident morning. And that transportation is also important because we have to make sure that the people who we identify or we record as person A, person B, is the same person that arrives at our office uh, with that same tag. So it's maintaining chain of custody as well. Um, in total, there were six victims. They all needed to be identified via scientific means. Uh, meaning DNA, because unfortunately they they were burned beyond recognition. Um, there were some international studies which make this a little bit more complicated, and we had to actually get DNA from 
the familiar a familiar DNA from across the seas, and so we had to get uh, law enforcement uh, involved from from that area from where they were belonged. So just an example of why they would need to be there. Then we we'll have to bring them, like I mentioned, they will have to come to our Fillmore or our district office. I call them Fillmore just as an incident morgue. Um, we potentially have a few more like in 9-11 where they actually established it separate from from a medical examiner's office yes um it required a lot of uh logistics personnel um and the location so we don't recommend it if we can avoid it we'll avoid it uh, but sometimes it would be needed especially this hazardous material we don't know um, if there's any dangerous uh, potential um, grenades or things that could explode we would actually have to establish a field morgue and not bring it to a district office uh, once they do come to either the field morgue or district office um, uh, we will start the forensic processing, taking an X-ray, determining cause of manner of death, um, doing those like uh, doing autopsies or examinations, and then they will certify the cause of manner of death for each of the decedents. Um, in that, in the Fillmore, they will also take fingerprinting, dental, um, and all of those things. Will Fillmore be like a demor? Yes, kinda. Um, and the more is the disaster mortality response team. I forgot what the um, O means for or stands for, but yes, it would be something like that. Something that we truly want to avoid just because it also means an um, unimaginable number of individuals that died in that incident. Um, like these are some just photos of um, some exercises that we had. I just wanted to put them in there. Uh, we were practicing how to establish a field more, um, doing examinations. Again, we, I mean, they mentioned the local medical examiners. We tried to train them so they could potentially also assist us in these um, incidents. And then um, the anti mortem data group or the family assistance center. Well, it's not. Um, the anti mortem data group is what the OCB will establish, and they will establish it at the Family Assistance Center. The Family Assistance Center is a location, a physical location that the locality will establish really quickly, um, so they can, uh, so family or friends can get assistance, uh, can get reunified, reunified with the loved ones if they're still alive, and unfortunately, if they're not we can start interview them to gather information or anti mortem data um, so we can identify them. Um, we will use a two people approach to actually have these conversations um, and we will complete a form basically uh, that we call victim identification profile form uh, where we ask um, anthropometrics, which is basically age, um, stature, any identifying features, tattoos, uh, eye color, hair color, whether they have had any injuries uh, in the past, uh, surgeries, um, you know, any possible uh, information that we can get so it can help us, we would ask. Um, wait a second, let me see where I am. Um, so this group, um, again, it, it's going to be very tasking for everybody. Um, like I mentioned, we will use a two person approach whenever possible, a medical investigator and an assistant who maybe perhaps an MRC volunteer can help us. Um, and we will need adequate private conversation spaces, um, ideally from entrances, but also near an exit. Wait. Far from an entrance, but near a different exit, um, the conversations we're going to have, they're going to be quite difficult. Um, we hope to interview people only if all attempts have been made to reunify them with a live uh, individual from the incident, um, meaning that the most likely possibility is that they are deceased. Uh, so we want to make sure that they have an appropriate um, exit plan so they're not expected to go back to everybody else that they were before with. Um, yep. 
Mm -hmm. I did mention that already. Um, in this group, we will also collect, scan, print, and return photos or other important documents brought by the family. Uh, we will need all medical records if they have them. Um, if somebody brings a photo telling us this is the person I'm looking for, we will take it, scan it. Um, and this is also a place where we can get a DNA or sample uh, or DNA sample. Um, um, yep. I also collect any dental records, x-ray, um, or anything. Um, as you may know, when you go to the doc to the dentist nowadays, they do take beautiful x-ray, um, x-ray photos, I guess, or x-rays of your dentures uh, or of your teeth, and those can potentially help to identify you uh, um, in the case, hopefully, never have to use those, but we have identified people like that in the past. Um, okay. So we will also assist in the scientific identification. Notice how I didn't mention that in the FAC, we will actually tell people to be their loved one is deceased. Uh, that's not a role that we would do because we won't know until we actually can process that information that we gather at the, uh, the intermodal data group or at the FAC. So uh, we will um, then um, use scientific means to do those identifications. Um, so, why do we want to do scientific identification, especially for a mass fatality incident? Well, first of all, it's a standard uh, for multiple fatalities whenever it's possible. We can imagine bodies can be severely decomposed. Uh, there could be commingling of remains. Uh, fragmentation of remains can, be, um, can get complex or extent of injury. Um, this is also the most reliable way. We, um, you all mentioned all those great shows like NCIS, SUV. Um, all of those shows usually show an episode of misidentification and how traumatic it is for the family. Well, that is true. Uh, we do not want to uh, stress the families even further. Visual, visual identification is not something that we recommend. Uh, families should not report to the to the morgue uh, for visual identification. This is something that usually in those shows they also show that it is possible. We do not recommend that. First, we have to maintain chain of evidence. Uh, secondly, I we do not believe that that is the most appropriate uh, or the best image that you want to have for your loved one. And we also don't have the facility. Um, then there is a question, uh, what is the turnaround time for DNA analysis and identification? That is a great question. Um, am I going to answer that later on? So, um, it all depends. Um, so if it's fingerprints, um, it could be quite fast, especially if they're already in file and that does count as a scientific means of identification, dental comparison. Again, it could be quite fast just because if they are, if a good x ray comparison exists and um, teeth are intact during the incident, they may be quite fast. Um, DNA, however, can take a while. Uh, unlike those famous shows that they turn around in like two minutes and they know the identification right away, it could be up to six to nine weeks. And that's if the DNA is not degraded. Um, and we have a good comparison. Um, if you remember in 9-11, um, there's still so many people that are identified. And I believe it was um, about a year ago when they had the latest identification. They know who those individuals may be, but they cannot have scientific way to, to corroborate it um, until they get that hit. So it, it can take weeks, months, uh, years or fortunately never. Um, I don't know what else was this going to say? Um, all right. Yes, uh, it also matters what reference sample we get. Uh, if it's a familiar DNA of an immediate sibling or parent, it helps a lot. Um, well, however, a lot of people believe that two brushes may be the best way to also to get that comparison, but it can come up with a couple of issues. A, it can only tell us that 
um, the toothbrush was used by the same person, but we don't know who would actually use that toothbrush, if that makes sense. Um, if any of you, like myself, share a house with several people, um, especially if we have children, I've heard that they get kind of, you know, I don't want to say it, but not nasty, but, you know, they can switch toothbrushes or things like that, or you accidentally use someone else's toothbrush then there is commingling of DNA or a mixture. So it makes it a little more difficult. Um, all right, so um, others will move along. So then the question that I also get asked a lot is should we prepare for small events or larger events? So I did find out a paper that was written in 2017 by Carol et al. from the New York OCME, um, in which they study uh, mass fatality incidents for 16 years, and they found about 137 mass fatality incidents, and they established a mass fatality incident in a in single incident that caused over 10 uh, fatalities. They, uh, in those 137 incidents, there were a total of almost 9 or 8,500 fatalities. The average number of mass fatality incidents per year was eight, and about three of them natural, such as hurricanes, um, I think it was hurricane flooding and fire, and man made, and discounted as shootings, um, explosions, um, motor vehicle accidents, and things like that. And they did find out that about there is about 62 uh, average fatalities per incident. Um, we do have to account that in this same um, time frame, we have some two of the worst uh, incidents, uh, which was Katrina and 9-11. Uh, um, so that did, you know, skew um, some of that average. Then I wanted to see if this actually still was the same. So I actually, uh, can I provide that reference? Sure. Um, I usually had it in here, but um, yeah, for sure, not a problem. Um, for Santi Yan, that is me. <laughs> it, is not, it is just <laughs> my own research that is not published. <laughs> I promise that I follow um, the same uh, uh, method that Carol et al. did. <laughs> you know, it was, it's not published. Um, I look for 2017 to 2022, uh, five years. Granted, um, and there were 39 incidents uh, plus one pandemic. In this case, I did remove the pandemic just because that is uh, millions of fatalities. Um, and per our definition, I uh, apologize, that's, that's a cat. Um, there will be natural deaths. Um, so we, I did not account it. It was skewed information way. Uh, but per year, there were also seven. Um, or about seven incidents. And this time we switched, it was about five naturals and two man-mates. And the average fatality and fatalities per incident was 40. Um, so that is a great question. What should we prepare? I always, I, I think we should find a manageable amount of number of fatalities to prepare for. And I think these are reasonable enough um, and we can always escalate um, or de-escalate, which will be preferable. Um, uh, I will email you uh, that um, that 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 study. Um, I have your email now, so I can do that. So, if you think um, this is our workforce, our total workforce, uh, we have one chief medical examiner. We have a total uh, position. Um, classifying waste position of 133. We have about 19, 19 authorized assistant chief medical examiners, uh, but we have a vacancies. Um, we have about 42 uh, authorized medical death investigation, investigation positions, but we have about a 20% rate of vacancy. We also have about 44 ten, technical assistants, um, which includes uh, security officers and those autopsy technicians uh, with a similar about 10 to 15 um, vacancy rate. 
and about 27 administrative staff. So if there is an incident like the ones I previously mentioned with about 50, uh, 40 to 62 fatalities, we're going to need help. Uh, a lot of help. So we do, uh, we do have limited personal resources. So we hope to partner with a lot of uh, other agencies that hopefully can um, already have background checks because everything we do has to be acceptable in a criminal or civil court. So we do hope that we can uh, tap into the medical resource corps. Um, most likely opportunities that we will need in a fatality incident is assistance. Um, ideally, there should be one assistant for each 10 member on an interview team at the FAC. Um, runners that can help uh, bring records from the morgue and incident, record management specialists that can actually transfer the information that we get into our databases of data enter as well. And potentially, um, I think I have more. Nope. Um, Yes, I actually do do have more. Um, um, remain storage um, of the administrative staff. Um, so in the past, we have had um, a partnership in which we actually train AMRC volunteers for the mass fatality response team that can assist the OCME, and we even got um, descriptions of this position um, and where they will be helping, and we had delineated training was both in person and online and to include actually observing some autopsies. Unfortunately, because of the lack of personnel that we have, we haven't been able to do that. I still hope I can, uh, we can bring that back, but I've been saying that for about a year and a half. Um, we also partnered with MRC for support roles for non-mass fatality events that can help us just with day-to-day -day activities. Uh, we do have medical debt investigator assistant, administrative assistant, autopsy assistant, and we actually, not too long ago, we placed one that's called long-term and identified uh, assistant. However, these are very few, um, and we opened up as the offices need them. The one issue is because we have so few personnel that can actually help manage the volunteers that come to our office. Uh, makes it very hard for them to actually do their work. So it, it's a really, it's a really complex situation, if that makes sense. Um, so how can you join the OCME support team and hopefully eventually the fatality uh, support team? Uh, well, clearly, hopefully you're an MRC volunteer. Uh, you have all your documents in place. Uh, you have background check and all of that. There is a train training, a train training, and the plan is uh, five seven seven zero. And you notify the MRC coordinators that you would like to be in that team, and you wait for that opportunity. In the short term, while we reestablish that um, training for the mass fatality incident team, um, we would, if there an incident occurs, we will tap from individuals that have completed this training uh, to come assist us. And um, just some expectations, if you ever come to work in our office, uh, we do um, expect confidentiality. You will be dealing with uh, um, decedents and their loved ones. Um, so anything that you see observe, you cannot share. Um, there should be no social media, photography in our offices or anywhere where you're working as an, um, on behalf of the OCME. Um, a professional appearance, teamwork, and again, in some instances, be okay with um, some sensitive information and photos and even, um, even seeing some decedents. Um, so I think that's all I got today. Does anybody have any questions?